I used to have a lot of trouble giving my testimony because, well, it just seemed so boring. I, I believed in Jesus the first time I heard about him, and I was five. And um, then I realized that the story gets more exciting if you go back uh, a few years. Uh, because the story really started back in 1939 with the question that a little boy had after his mom prayed a little sing-songy prayer with him at bedtime. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my Lord, the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, he says, Mom, what happens if I die? And he said he didn't get the answer to that question for 14 more years. And that, that little boy was my dad, who happens to be here today. Wave. That's my dad right over there. You can like that. He didn't wave, but... And then... Um, and then um, uh, really a few years later, in the late 40s, maybe what was it, 1948, Mom? Um, Mom uh, was just a little girl in the third grade, and guess what? Uh, down the road from where she lived, she was in a messed up home with a really confused mom and dad who were really struggling to find their way, and down the road, a church did a vacation Bible school. And so she went down the road with her sister and that was over 60 plus, 65 plus years ago. And she's walked with Jesus all, the, for the first time she heard the story of Jesus, she loved him. And she met him and she came to know him. And so that is why, that is why you see the, the neat decorations on the platform today. And that is why so much effort and work has gone in to just think there might be a little Janie or a little Kenny in our, in our neighborhoods where we live that we could invite that would hear the story of Jesus for the very first time and love him for the rest of their lives. That would be awesome. I, uh, when I was a kid, I went to vacation Bible school and I have such sweet, vivid memories of that. Just, I, you, you can't appreciate this when you're an adult because when you're an adult, you have to get a Maserati to get that excited. You have to, you have to get, you know, you have to really, but, but when you're a kid, it's like, ah! vacation Bible school week and this week and you and you can't sleep at night and you wake up with sweaty palms in the morning because you're gonna have vacation Bible school and uh, so we're praying too that our kids who may already know the Lord uh, would have embedded in their hearts sweet memories about real Jesus people that are doing real Jesus things authentic Jesus followers who really do love the Lord and who really do follow the Lord and that Christ would be sweet to them all of their lives. The church would be something that they love all of their lives. This is what we long for. So what can you do? You know you can really pray this week. And you can still serve, I'm sure. You can pray. Uh, you, can, you can invite kids to vacation Bible school. And that's why, it's why we're doing it. That's why you see, this is why I've stepped aside and I preach at the riverbank here today. Uh, they, they did all this and then they said, Pastor, would you like us to roll this up so you can preach? I'm like, are you kidding? That would be a lot of work. And so I'll be off to the side today. And so maybe if you grew up in a church with a split chancel, you'll feel right at home because I'm over here now. And uh, we're, we're in the book of James, and we're talking about what is an authentic Christian really like. And, and so open your Bible, the book of James. There's a copy of the Bible in the pew. If you don't have one with you, let's go scroll to that on your electronic device or just listen real carefully. I'm going to read every word of it. But we're, we're talking about a book of the Bible written by the half-brother of Jesus himself, who was a little reluctant to believe in Jesus, but then after he rose from the dead, well, that was kind of convincing for him. And he became a follower of Jesus. And he wrote this beautiful, beautiful, straightforward, hard-hitting book, the, the epistle of James, which is like the Proverbs of the New Testament. And the heart of it really is the, 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 is the sparkling possibilities of what can happen if a person is genuine in their following of Jesus. Just beautiful book. And it's so straightforward, so helpful, and so practical that it caused me a great deal of pain this week. I'll explain that to you uh, in my message. And so we've kind of been looking at what is a real Christian like? The whole world that we live in is going, I love the Christian idea. I would just love to meet one. Right? I love the Jesus thing. If I really knew somebody that acted like Jesus, I think I would like them. You know, I, I love you. I'm not picking on you. But right, that's what, that's what the world we're living in is saying. It's like, I'm okay with Jesus. I want to meet somebody who's like him. I want, and, and, and I know you're here 
because you want to be like him. And, uh, and by the way, we love that little, is that halo or hazel? Yeah, and we love that little voice right there. Anyway, uh, so uh, I get halo and hazel confused. Anyway, we're, 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 we want to be authentic as Jesus followers. I know that's why you're here. I know that you don't want to be a hypocrite. I know that you don't want to displease the Lord by saying you're a follower of Jesus, but not being a follower of Jesus. And that's why we're talking about this. We're sincere, and, and, we, and we understand that the, the world is looking on for a demonstration of what Jesus always said. And our children are watching. The little ones are watching. They want, we want them to be raised in a church where when somebody says to them, the church is full of hypocrites, they say, not my church. No, no. No, I, the people in my church, they pray for me. People in my church, they sent me to camp. The people in my church, they listened to me. They loved me. They helped me. They supported me. They forgave me, right? They, they loved me right through my weird years when I did weird stuff, you know, just to, just to that's, that's what, authentic, you know, Jesus followers. Now, I, I, I was thinking back, last summer was quite a summer. I was on the road. I preached 117 times. And I was thinking back of the one Sunday I didn't preach. I was only, uh, last, last summer, only out of the pulpit one Sunday. I was driving my car back from Texas where I met our newest grandson at the time, Waylon Wesley. And I was driving home on a Sunday. I, I got up real early and I, I wanted to get a lot of miles behind me. And then it was about 11 o'clock. And I was thinking, I, I got to find a place where I can pull over and be with some of God's people. And uh, so I was driving along and I was thinking, well, where am I going to be at 11? And there was this little charismatic church uh, by the side of the road there, where I arrived at 11 o'clock. And I parked my car right at 11 o'clock. And I went in and joined these precious brothers and sisters who were doing what I did every Sunday of my life growing up. And that is just thanking God for what he had done for them talking about Jesus and how much they loved him, singing praises and giving gifts. And I joined with those people that were strangers to me, but they were my brothers and sisters. There's a part of the old creed that a lot of Christians recite every week. And a part of that creed is, I believe in the communion of the saints. You ever heard that phrase? I believe in the communion of the saints. I want you to know something. I believe in the communion of the of the saints. I believe in the communion of the saints. I believe the saints, the holy ones, the ones who are washed in the blood of Jesus, followers of Jesus, are in a special fraternity, a special sorority, a special community, a special bond of love that we are devoted to each other. The ones that have died that are already in heaven, the Bible says they're a part of that communion in a mysterious way. And those of us that are alive are a part of that communion. In a, in a more concrete, invisible way. And yet together, for all that have gone on before, all who knew and really loved Jesus, and all those in our world today who know and really love Jesus are a part of the communion of the saints, that there's a fellowship, a fraternity, a oneness, a love. Now, here's the problem, though. They can really get under your skin sometimes. They can do the dumbest things. They still sin. I mean, I know you don't, but they do, right? They, they still sin. They, they still hurt our feelings. They still misunderstand. They still do things that are wrong. And sometimes they are seriously hard to love. Matter of fact, sometimes it's, it's so much easier to talk bad about them. So much, sometimes it's so much easier to gossip about them. Sometimes it's so much easier to slander them. It's so much easier to uh, kind of bicker and war with them. Now, this has happened in the church of Jesus Christ since the church of Jesus Christ began. Because this book was only about 50 years into the Jesus movement, maybe 45, 50 years into the Jesus movement when it was written. And already James, the brother of Jesus, says this. And now we're going to actually read the text instead of just talking about it all day. James chapter 3, we're going to read through James 4 and uh, verse 12. James 3 and verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, 
but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom that is above, from above, is first pure and then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James is just starting out by saying, there, this bitter jealousy and selfish ambition doesn't come from the wisdom from heaven. And then he keeps going in the same vein. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your, your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder. You covet and cannot obtain. You fight and quarrel. I, I, I'm sorry, I have to make a comment. When you read this, you, you, you want to ask a question, really? Did, did you just notice what he said? He's kind of talking to the church, right? And he goes, you know, you fight, you quarrel, you murder. My question is, oh, it must have been a lot worse there than it is here. I mean, I've seen some Donnie Brooks in churches, but I've never actually seen anybody murder anybody. It might not have been, it might have been, uh, it might have been hyperbole. It might have been a poetic device, but it's a powerful one. <laughs> He's like, okay. So he says, you desire and cannot have, so you murder. You covet. You cannot obtain. You fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You're adulteresses. In the original, it's adulteresses because bride of Christ, I think, right? You adulteresses, don't you, don't you know friendship of the world is, is, is enmity, it's hatred for God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace and therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord, and he will exalt you. And do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge? Your neighbor. Now, when you, when, when you read this text, if you just go through and you, you kind of cherry pick the problems, let me give you, you know, what they, how he listed them. He, he says in, in chapter th uh, 3, there's bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And then a little bit later in the chapter, he repeats it again. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. This is something we do in the church, but we don't talk about it in the church. Jealousy is the motive behind the murder of Jesus. Right? Jealousy is why they killed Jesus. The religious establishment was jealous. He was cutting in on their, their game, and so they had him murdered. This is what you do, right? They, remember, they, the, the, remember we talked about this? He raised Lazarus from the dead, and they debated about whether they should kill him or whether they should kill Lazarus to kind of undo his miracle because it made him popular. This is a, jealousy will make you do really weird, bad, ugly, evil, demonic things. Yeah. E and even Christians. That's what James is saying here. And we'll, we'll, we'll pick it apart in a minute. We'll take it apart. But, but then in verse uh, chapter 4, he, he adds to s jealousy and selfish ambition, quarrels and fights and murder and fighting and quarreling. Disagreements. Sharp disagreements and, and selfish uh, disagreements. And then in verse 11, speaking evil against one another. Speaking against a brother. Judging a brother. And in this whole mix, right, he's going to talk about worldliness, but he's not going to talk about the things you're thinking about, like 
going to the bar and getting drunk or, or, or taking somebody else's wife home with you. No, he's not even going to mention that stuff. He's only going to talk about the churchy sins, like when you talk behind somebody's back or when you gossip or quarrel or when you're jealous of somebody else because of what they have that you don't have or because of something they get to do that you don't get to do. The churchy, you know, kind of acceptable, forgivable, easily forgivable sins. These are the ones he says show you are worldly and you are, you're behaving like an enemy of God. And he says, these are the things that are earthly and soulish and devilish. So, so it's, it's kind of serious. Here, here's how I want to arrange uh, the handling of, the, of this text as we kind of explain our way through it. That might help, help you as you think your way through it. And that's this. What do you do when you're tempted not to love the people that you're really supposed to love? What do you do? There are three things here that come out to me so clearly. They have worked me over this week, okay? Uh, this has been a hard week for me because this text has been roughing me up all week long. If I hadn't had the experiences of my life that I had, this would be so theoretic. It would be so easy. But because of, you know, the experiences that you have, then you have to actually go, okay, am I going to obey God now that, that I've actually had this experience? Right? It's one thing to say, oh, yeah, if somebody hurts me, I'm going to forgive them. Another thing for him to hurt you, right? Then it gets, then you have to really, are you really going to, do you really believe in the communion of the saints or not? That's a great question. Do you, do you believe in the communion of the saints enough to love the saints when they don't love you? Now there's a good question for you. And James gives these powerful three things. I'm going to share them with you. The first thing. When you're tempted not to love another brother because he's hurt you or sister, try to see God's point of view. Now, in other words, look at it like this. If it, well, Travis is here, I, I, last week I get to use you for a public illustration. So I can't imagine Travis and I having a disagreement because he's so bright. We would disagree. Uh, we would agree about everything. But, but, like, but what if we had a disagreement? There would be like my point of view and then there would be Travis's point of view. You know, and, and, and then I would say, well, Travis, you just need to sit down and listen to me for a while, and I'm going to give you my point of view. And then he's a very nice guy. He would listen really well, I'm sure, and listen for a long time. And, and then, then somewhere in there, his insides, even though he's very quiet, would be going, <laughs> are you going to listen to my point of view now? And then if I was wise, I would have started with his point of view. But, but I would say, well, how do you feel? And then he would say what he thought, and it would be different than what I thought. This is where we usually stop. Now, James is saying, that's not where you stop. Here's where you stop. You ask another question. What is God's point of view? Here's how I see it. Here's how he sees it. Okay. How does God see it? Look in the text. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast and be false to the truth. This wisdom that does, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above. This is earthly and unspiritual and demonic. Where selfish ambition, jealousy, and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder and every vile practice. So, the, so when I say I'm wise, and yet it, it leads to selfish ambition, and I'm demanding my own way, and jealousy, then I'm not wise. That wisdom is not from the Lord. The wisdom that's from the Lord, listen to the description. This is gorgeous. Listen to the description of the wisdom from the Lord. Verse 17 and 18. This is so beautiful. Wisdom from above is pure and peaceable and gentle and open to reason and full of mercy and good fruits and impartial and sincere. And it yields a harvest of righteousness. A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So wisdom, what is wisdom? Wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. Wisdom is God's perspective on things. Real wisdom isn't I overcome you with my arguments. Real wisdom isn't the guy with the most money wins the argument. Real wisdom isn't the most stubborn and ugly person, you know, wins the day. Real wisdom is God, what do you say? How do you see this? I'm going to be quiet for a while, Lord. You show me how I should see this. This is powerful. Ask God to give you his perspective on that situation where you're tempted not to love somebody. And then, the, the, then you will notice the fruit of that is pure and peaceful and gentle and 
considerate and submissive and full of mercy and good fruit and impartial and sincere and it produces a harvest of peace that's awesome we are now in michigan in the time of sweet corn and ripe tomatoes and watermelons it's it's fruitful a time when you can go to the store and you can buy all these beautiful fresh healthy fruits and you can eat them and when i read this text I I see that picture that he's given to us. A person who is seeking peace is going to produce a harvest of beautiful fruit in his life. You want to have a family that has beautiful things in it. You seek peace together. You try to see things the way God sees things. Don't force your opinion on that other person. Don't insist on your opinion. Humble yourself and say to God, how do you see this God? And I will tell you this about the way God sees it. You can tell in the text one of the things is he sees the he has the eternal perspective not just the earthly perspective but the heaven and earth the 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 full reality he has to seize the full reality the reality of our life is that spiritual things are a reality right not a mystic non-reality but a reality there are angels there are demons there is a spiritual world around our physical world it's all one thing and it's all real that's the reality. That's how God sees it. What's, what's going on there? So I, I don't want to belabor this, though I could spend a long time. Would you think about that? When you're in a conflict or when you're tempted to have a conflict or when you're tempted not to love somebody that you really are supposed to love, when you're tempted not to believe in the communion of the saints, then say, God, you're going to have to help me see this the way you see it because all I'm seeing right now is the way I see it. That's, that's super helpful. Now here's the second thing, and this is in the chunk that's in chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. And it's a rich passage. And the heart of it is to humble yourself, especially in taking your own sin very seriously, examining your own heart when you're in a conflict, and you're tempted not to love somebody, and being brutally honest before God. Anything less than that, the text is going to say, is worldly. It's worldly. It's antagonistic to God. It's what, 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 this is chapter 4, verse 1. What causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Is it not this? Your, your passions or your, your desires are at war in you. You desire and don't have. You murder and covet and can't obtain. You fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions You adulterous people, in other words, you're not faithful to God. You're the bride of Christ, you're not being faithful to God. The evidence of that unfaithfulness is this unwillingness to um, believe and practice the communion of the saints. Get it? Not, it it would be true that the sins of the flesh, like going out and committing adultery or, 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 or... or getting high on drugs or whatever, you know, that, all that stuff that you tend to think those bad people out there do and you don't do, right? But he's not talking about that. He's talking about like the churchy sins of digging in on my own way. You dig in on your own way and you're jealous and you, and you have strife, then you are worldly and you are not acting like you love God, you are acting like you hate God. That's what it says right there in the word. It, it, there, whoever therefore wishes to be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Don't say, I'm wise, and I'm insisting on my own way. No, that's foolish. That's not from above. And don't say, I love God, and I'm insisting on my own way. No, you don't love God if you're insisting on your own way. You, you, you humble yourself. And then he says, this is an a, a, a enigmatic, mysterious, and beautiful little phrase. Mark this and dig deeper, because when you do, you'll find riches, right? Or do you suppose it is to know, this is chapter 4, verse 5. Do you suppose it is to no purpose, the scripture says, somewhere, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Kind of mysterious, right? What's that mean? He yearns jealously. So, so the spirit of God dwells in us. So God, if you're a believer, lives in you. Right? Like my wife is out of town. She's helping her aging aunt today. She's going to get back in town today. Now, I want you to imagine she walks in the house and I have a picture of another woman on the coffee table. I only use illustrations like this when Lois is out of town because she would (laughs) beat me up for sure. There's a picture of another woman and she goes, who's that? And I go, not a big deal. I don't sleep with her. We We just go to a movie every once in a while and she listens to my stories and whatnot. And we go out to dinner from time to time. 
but we don't sleep together. You say, this is a really offensive illustration. Yeah, that's, it is, isn't it? Like, are you, th- how do you think Lois would handle that? <laughs> I would just say, y- you'd probably be having to arrange my funeral, I imagine, but it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be good. Uh, she's not that kind of person that would curl up in a ball and cry. She would hurt you bad. <laughs> I'd be like, are you kidding me? I'd be like, ah, I'm not sleeping with her. I'm just looking at her picture from time to time. That's sick, isn't it? You don't even like me telling it. Else. You look at me like, oh, that's right. That's just that's wrong. We, we owe our highest loyalty to God. He lives in us. When we do things that are anti-Jesus, it's like, wow, you're not really taking me into this, are you? You've got the Holy Spirit living in you, and you're not going to love them like I love them. Everything in me loves them. Everything in me loves them, and you're not going to love them. You're so disloyal to me. You can't do that. You can't say you're a follower of Jesus and you don't love his people. You can't do that. It doesn't work like that. It'd be like you saying, that little girl on the end of the praise team is our baby. If you said, I love you, Kim, but I hate her, I'd be going, you're sick, that's weird. You can't love me and not love her. It's, it can't work like that. Right? And then the pure and high and holy love of God, where he desperately loves people who don't deserve it like us. And he wants us to be patient with them and forgive them and love them. And we say, ah, but they hurt me. And he says, but they're my children. And the perspective is, one day we're walking down the street in heaven and they walk by us and we're like, how did you get here? <laughs> what in the world? He's like, it was Jesus, how did you get here? I'm like, are you kidding me right now? I think about that a lot. It's helpful, it's like, so humble yourself. I had, a, I had you ever get foolish advice from a wise person? <laughs> I had a really wise godly Levi Wisner, wouldn't mind me saying this, preached on humility once. Mom and dad know Levi Wisner, that, and he was a godly man. He preached on humility one time. And, and I thought, wow, that's good. I, I need that. So I go up to him, and I say, what should I do? And he goes, you should pray for God to humble you. Now, that was not, he, he's a smart guy, but that was not good advice. <laughs> that is not what the Bible said. What does the Bible say? Humble yourself. The subtle difference don't say, God, humble me. He's really good at what he does. Just don't do that. Just, not, just humble yourself. That's what the Bible says. Humble yourself. So I go, I remember kneeling down going, God, humble me. I'm like, wham, I got this humbling. Like, I still makes me shake when I think about how humbling it was. Like, oh, wow. Another wise man once told me, he said, if you will humble yourself, if you'll look for new ways to humble yourself every day, you will have a constant stream of God's grace flowing into your life. That's what he said. I go, why is that? He said, it's this passage right here. And this is in verse 6. He gives grace. This is, he yearns jealously over the spirit he's made to dwell in us. In other words, the spirit of God lives in us and he has every right to jealously, to have a, a, a jealous and pure love for us. And then he gives grace. In other words, he's charis, grace, gift. He's a giver. It's his nature to give. He wants to gift us. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So if you're proud, he doesn't give you his gifts. But if you're humble, he gives you his gifts. How many of you want to receive the gifts of God? Two of you. That's really good. (laughs) Sometimes you just think, I must be doing something wrong, Lord. Yeah. You just didn't want to vote. I get it. You you, you want, how many of you want gifts from God? He's looking. He's looking. Yeah. Like he's looking and he knows I'm an idiot. But anyway, yeah, you want gifts from God. Okay. How do you get them? You humble yourself. It's counterintuitive. Uh, Dad, I heard Grandpa say this. He got it, I think, from um, Andrew Murray. Do you remember Grandpa saying this when he would preach? He would say, when I was young, I used to think God's gifts were on the top shelf. And I had to climb up there to get them. And then the longer I've walked with the Lord, I realized he put his best gifts on the bottom shelf. And I have to kneel on my knees to get them. That's the way it is. God's best gifts are like for the people that are willing to get down on their knees and go, okay, God. I'm going to humble myself. And this is especially how do you humble yourself? You admit you're, you're part of the wrong. You, you're scrupulously careful about finding out, God, is there any piece of that where I was wrong? So it says, he gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Submit to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched. Mourn and weep. 
let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And humble yourselves before the Lord. He will exalt you. So the, so the wise advice isn't, you know, ask God to humble you. The wise advice is look for new ways to humble yourself every day so there's this constant stream of grace flowing into your life because he gives his grace to the humble. You know, we have the grace of God in salvation, which is the free gift of salvation. We have the grace of God in our sanctification, which is the spirit continually gifting us for the desire and empower to, to live uh, the godly way. And this is what, these are the, kind of unblushing, amazing, beautiful promises that are embedded in this. I'm glad I have a Bible that I could read these things and realize that God says things like, if you draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. Really? Yeah. Sign up for the men's retreat, guys. Yeah. I got to love you. I'm going I'm to go up north and I'm going to spend a week just examining my life, my marriage, my parenting, my grandparenting. Examine my fellowship with you. I'm going to draw near. Will, will God meet you if you do that? Yep. And you don't even have to go up north. You do that right here in beautiful Jackson County. You take your pickup truck on your lunch hour and you go out to the lake and park it and say, God, I'm open to hearing anything I need to hear from you. Is there any way that I have displeased you? Is there any person that I've harmed or wronged? Is there anything I need to take care of? I humble myself. I'm sorry. I mean it. If you humble yourself like that, then you'll feel uh, f the, the fragrant, like a beautiful flowing grace start flowing into your life. Because he is so eager to gift you with those things that are valuable like that. Humility. <laughs> the woman was attending a conference in Alabama. She was busy. She had her things. She's going to go to these lectures. And it was years ago in the, in the deep south, Alabama. She got out. There was an African-American man standing there. She said, I need you to take my bags to my room. He took her bags to her room. She tipped him generously. And then she went to the lecture. And when the president of the institute stood up to give the first lecture, it was the black man that she had asked to carry her bags to the room. <laughs> Booker T. Washington, president of the Tuskegee Institute, carried her bags to the room and took the tip and kept it. <laughs> He humbled himself and uh, obviously was exalted. This is a human illustration of what James is saying is powerful truth. So let's review, okay? So we got people we're tempted not to love. We say we believe in the communion of the saints, but we're tempted not to really commune with the saints. So we say, God, I have my opinion. They have their opinion. What's your opinion? Please help me see this the way you see it. Second, any wrong on my part, I'm going to humble myself and mourn over that. Third, this is the next section, and the final one, verse 11 and, and 12. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges a brother speaks evil against the law, judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge who is able, who is able, who is able to save and destroy. I like that. He's able. He is able. He's a good judge, and he can save and destroy. And then it says, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So the third bit of advice here is let God do the judging. Now we have discernment. We, we discern right and wrong and all that. But, but in terms of condemning others, we tend to like vilify people, demonize people, even condemn them to hell. They messed me over. I, I bet they're not even saved. We'll be shocked if we see them in heaven. They couldn't even possibly be saved. You kind of forget that you also have a zoo of past offenses that you've been forgiven for, right? You kind of forget that. And you vilify, demonize, or condemn, or eager to condemn other people. This is repeated in such a powerful way in 1 Corinthians 4. I, I want to read this to you. When you're tempted to judge, when you're tempted to be the final judge and jury on somebody else, when they've, when they've hurt you and you don't want to love them. Listen to this. This is Paul now writing in 1 Corinthians 4, verse, verse 1. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. I love this. Paul's like, it is, you, whether you judge me or not is really not what I'm worried about. Or a human court, as serious as that is, I'm not really worried about that. And, and he says, in fact, I don't even judge myself. I don't trust myself 
to judge myself. I, I'm not in regard, I don't care if you judge me, and I'm not really concerned about human courts, and I'm not even trusting myself to judge myself. But I am thereby acquitted. In other words, even though I don't really know anything against myself right now. But this is what he says. But it's the Lord who judges me. This is great men and women have a consciousness of God is my judge. God is the one I live before. God is the one I stand before. I am not aware of anything against myself, verse 4, but I'm not thereby acquitted. In other words, just because I think I'm innocent doesn't make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things that are now hidden in darkness and disclose the purposes of the heart, and then each one will receive his commendation from the Lord. This is exactly what James is saying. He's saying God is a judge, and he's really, really good at it. And he can, he can bless or reward, and he can condemn. And he's perfectly capable of it. His judgment is perfect. It's not the right time for judgment yet. He hasn't come back yet. And you are not the right person for judgment. Let him do This is a great freedom when you say, okay, I think that person's done wrong, but I'm just going to turn him over to the Lord. And I'm not going to judge him. The Lord's going to take care of that. Maybe you have had great injury done against you by a former mate or person that harmed you or somebody that you loved in a great way. And this is going to be a great freedom for you when you realize, I'll just let God take care of this. I'm, another way I look at it is like, I'm going to let the merciful God who's forgiven a zoo of unforgivable things for me, I'm going to turn them over to him and let him do whatever he wants. And I'm also going to pray that they ask to get in on the mercy deal. Uh, all the unconscionably bad things they've done. I'm going to pray that someday before they breathe their last breath, they call on God for his mercy, and then he gives them his mercy, and then we're in heaven together, and we'll look at each other and we'll go, oh, by the grace of God, we didn't deserve to be here, but because Jesus died on the cross for every one of our sins, we have eternity in heaven, and, we, and the communion of the saints is complete. And the people that we hated, we love. This is the Christian way. We can't let go of it, or what do we have? I had a great injury done to me and my family. Most of you know that. And every once in a while, there's an additional injury added to that. This happened to me on February 14th this year. And I received a phone call, and I realized that the, the, the injury that had happened to me was compounded by an additional injury. And when that happened, it, I was going to go to lunch with my wife, and I couldn't eat. So I didn't want to tell her what had happened. So we went to lunch, and we sat down, and... She said, why aren't you eating? Like, if I'm not eating, there's something wrong, right? I go, I can't eat right now. And she said, why? And I told her. And she put her fork down, and she didn't eat anymore. So I went home that night, and I thought, that's it. I'm not going to be treated like this anymore. I'm going to expose this whole deal, you know. I'm going to use my words to just tell the story. <laughs> So I, I delighted in that idea for a while, and I, I, I'm kind of good with words. I, I, could, I could tell that story. When I, was a, when I was a kid, people picked on me. They beat me up on the way home from school a lot, and that was extremely painful. It made me think there must be something really wrong with me, that people didn't like me, you know, that they beat me up. Uh, when I went to Moody Bible Institute, John MacArthur came to preach one day, and he was preaching, and he told a story, and Tori grabbed it for him. Thousands of kids were there, a couple thousand kids were there. He said it was a story about a boy out in California that went to school, and he got picked on. I perked up my ears. He said what the guys that were picking on him didn't know is that he had an older brother. And Roger was his name, and his older brother was a middle linebacker for, for USC. Don't you love where this story's going? <laughs> so his older brother shows up at school the next day and says, point to him. And Roger's like, him, right over there. Roger's brother walks over to the kid, picks him up, walks over to some bushes, and just tosses the kid in the bushes. Didn't hurt him. Just tossed him in the bushes, and he said, if you ever mess with Roger again, I'm not going to throw you in the bushes next time. And then he just walked away, and then nobody messed with Roger again. And when John MacArthur told that story, everybody laughed. And the whole place, there's just this laughter that went across the whole place. 
except I wasn't laughing, I just crying. And I thought to myself, why am I crying? And everybody else is laughing. A part of my insides are like, when people get to know me, they're gonna, they're gonna pick on me again. So at three o'clock in the morning, I'm over in my house and I'm thinking about what I'm gonna write, what I'm gonna say and who I'm gonna call and how I'm gonna take care of this business that people injured me and my family. And then I got that little voice in my heart from the Lord that kind of went like this. Remember when you were a boy? Yeah. Remember how you always wish you had an older brother? Yeah. He said, have I been taking care of you? Yeah. You want to defend yourself or you want your older brother to take care of you? And I said, I get it. That's what James is saying right there. You have a judge. Now he's merciful, he's good. He's willing to offer mercy to them like he did you. But if they don't ask for mercy, he's perfectly willing, he's perfectly capable of destroying them or saving them. That's the, that's the word here. He's able to save and he's able to destroy. Now, Christian people do not want their enemies destroyed. You, you're not Christian if you say, send them to hell. That ain't Christian. Christians go, let them have mercy. Just thumbs up. Help them to ask for mercy so that you can freely give it to them. And then they say, all this giving, he's willing to give you wisdom that's beautiful and full. He jealously loves you and desires your love. He's eager to gift you, verse 6. He's eager to be close to you, draw, no, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. He's willing to judge, defend, and protect you. But do you? But do you believe in the communion of the saints? I guess that's what it really comes down to. Do you believe in the communion of the saints? I only show you a, a picture of this because I got a minute. You didn't sing long enough, so I have more time. <laughs> so you did pretty, you was pretty singing, it just wasn't long enough. So listen to Hebrews chapter 12. This is a bonus, and I don't expect a, a more pay for this. I'll just give you this. It's a, <laughs> Hebrews 12 is a picture of the communion of the saints. Uh, it's, a, it's, you know, you, um, in, in the church's one foundation, the, the song has a little phrase, and mystic sweet communion with those whose, whose rest is one. What is that mystical communion we have with those who are with the Lord? This is it, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 12. What, what the writer of Hebrews is doing is saying, you are not under the condemnation of the law, that's Mount Sinai. You are in the church, that's Mount Zion. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you're not under Mount Sinai anymore, that Mount Sinai did its work. We're under Mount Zion. And the Mount, Z Mount Sinai is dark, thundering, and the emphasis on God's wrath and, you know, and that part of the goodness of his character. Mount Zion is the culmination of all of the, 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 the you know, like the eternal state, but it's already commencing in, in heaven in terms of the worship that's always go already going on. And then it has this rich passage, and it describes the communion of the saints, among other things. And so now you're in, um, but you have come, verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels in a festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous who are made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is a description of the heavenly gathering, the saints, you know, the saints triumphant, with the Lord and the spirits of the saints made perfect, run to perfection. We are in the communion of the saints, and it is our blessed opportunity to contribute to the communion of the saints. And how you do that? By loving people that you are tempted not to love. By doing the hard work of thinking like God thinks, humbling yourself and letting him be your older brother, judge. He'll take care of you. I like to pray together, um, and may God help you. If you don't know the Lord, we're going to have folks that come here at the end of the service and stand, and you can come up and talk to them and initiate like a gospel conversation about how you could know the Lord yourself. And if you're a believer and the uh, Spirit has worked on you like he worked on me this week, 
then you know what to do. And go alone with the Lord and make sure that you're, the way you behave and what you say about whether you believe in the communion of the saints is the same. Let's pray. Now, Lord, I, I do thank you for your word, how it's like a mirror that's held up to our soul that shows us uh, what needs to be changed. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, like milk and, and honey. It's sweet to our taste and healthy for us. It's the word of God uh, is um, it's sharp. It sometimes can just cut us. Uh, and and, and uh, we're just grateful for it. And now as a church, uh, I pray for a couple of things. One, that, uh, Lord, that we would be genuine and sincere uh, followers of Jesus, especially here in this area about how we treat people we're tempted not to love. And I also pray that this week, all the little ones that come around would see your beauty and, and your sweetness and would see that your, your mercy and that they would follow you all the days of their lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. We're going to be singing a song called Our God Reigns. And if you'll give me some permission here, it's going to sum up the sermon because the very first thing is going to talk about the communion of the